Thank you very much, uh, Barbara. I'm extremely happy to be here, very pleased to be at Harvard, a great university, and to meet old friends uh, that I've known for several years back. Uh, I would begin by talking about the autocratic environment and the initial democratic breakthroughs in the, in, the, in, the, in the Arab East or the Middle East, the Arab region. I would only show two slides, and this is at the very strong recommendation from Ikhuri. He said that don't, uh, this is not a classroom, so you don't have to use uh, the PowerPoint. So, I mean, I would be talking about really three things that derive from a fundamental question that all of us are facing. And this is, uh, will the recent uprisings in the Arab world actually lead, ultimately lead to a democratic transformation uh, accompanied with equitable economic and social development. I think this is the basic issue that all researchers are facing in the Arab world as well as here abroad uh, that are trying to answer. Uh, or will they fail in achieving this objective? Are we going to be achieving full democratic processes or is it going to be quasi-democracy, partial democracy, and so on? Well, I don't know, I don't claim, I don't claim uh, to have the answers these easy answers that I will leave to Rami Khouri, he will tell you, in fact, whether this is going to be accomplished or not. I will take the harder question and try and describe the background of all, of all this for the question. And I will start first with uh, reminding ourselves of the prevailing autocratic environment in the Arab world, in the Arab region, at least until the end of 2010, beginning of 2011, that witnessed the Tunisian and the Egyptian uprisings. Then I'll try to answer the question as to why has this been the case? Why is it that the autocracy in the Arab world has persisted for such a long time post-independence? Most of the Arab countries became independent after the Second World War. And then finally I'll touch briefly on the initial breakthroughs uh, and are, is, are, is the autocracy, are the foundations of autocracy in the world being shaken now? And if they are going to be shaken, are they going to be leading to something more substantive in terms of democratic development? So I'll take them up one by one by one by one. Let me start with the... What is that? Wait, could you, could you put it on, please? All right. This is just a, a graph. Uh, Party scores, 44 scores, you know, that are used for time series purposes. Uh, they have their limitations, but at least they take them back as they are now. That shows why is it that the Arab world has been different from the rest of the regions in the past, whereas well, at least it's 1960, post Second World War. You find that uh, most regions, in fact, crossed into the positive zone of the party score in the late 80s, early 90s, whereas the Arab region continued being autocratic despite what has been happening elsewhere and despite the fact that the Arab region has come to know notable socio-economic development. The same graph, the second graph, takes the uh, Economic Interest Units Democracy Index across the regions and again you will find that indeed the Middle East and North Africa score what they are, uh, what is classified as autocracies. Uh, the only four democracies according to this index are uh, North America and Western Europe. The rest are either flawed democracies or hybrid regimes. Now, of course, in the index, in the Economist Index, uh, the MENA region includes both Israel and Iran with Israel having a score of about 7 and Iran a score of about less than 2. So in a sense, they counterbalance, they counterbalance the average. And even if you take them out, the average that results will still, still place the region as a whole in the so-called autocracy region. Uh, there are few countries, few Arab countries, that are not really autocratic in that sense. Uh, they, they belong more to the hybrid, uh, hybrid regimes. And this includes Lebanon, uh, Mauritania, Tunisia, and 
the fourth country that now I cannot, I cannot remember, Algeria, Algeria. These are classified as hybrid regimes, in the sense they're not full autocracies, but nonetheless, when you look at the region as a whole, this is the picture that really emerges. Now, this is 2.10 and 2.11. The question, of course, will we be speaking about presenting the same graph and the same table next year? Would it be the same score? This is something that I cannot really answer. Hopefully, the, av the averages will, will go up. The graph that we showed, of course, showed uh, that the Arab democracy scores did decline from in the, six, in the early 60s up to the, through the 70s and mid 80s, and then this, the average started going up. If you recall that in the first parts of, the, of this uh, period we're talking about, there were military coups, there were uh, governments taking over uh, the, 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 the economy, there were uh, nationalization and all sorts of things that really entrenched the role of the state. And then after that, especially after the, the, the movements in Eastern Europe in the early 90s, you started to have political liberalization, limited political liberalization in various Arab countries that pulled up the negative score. It pulled up the average of the score, of the democracy score, but it really did not put it in the <coughs> positive zone. So this is the explanation of the curve that we show in the, in the polity graph. And the question is, why is it, why is it that the Arab region, compared to other, other regions, developing regions in the world, did not succeed in moving from the so-called autocracy stage into a less autocracy stage, into a more democratic stage? There is a growing literature on this subject, and I think uh, Isha is one of those now working on the RF on the question of Arab, Arab, Arab democracy and Arab transform, Arab, uh, democratic transformation. And these explanations go all the way from a broad historical viewpoint, going all the way back to the Islamic empire, if not before, to a, a more focused analysis on what happened in the Arab region following independence from colonial rule. Let me give you very quick illustrations of what the literature says. It's very, very limited. Uh, uh, illustrations. We have the famous modernization theory of Lipset and Barrow that says that as countries develop, the democratic space becomes uh, larger with development. You have some people like uh, Ulfiler and Lustig that emphasize the non-determining role of income in the probability of transition democracy. It's not necessarily an economic issue. It's a non-economic determinant of transition. Churoski, if, if I'm pronouncing the name correctly, is this the way we pronounce it? Chrosky? Huh? He says that when income is sufficiently high, democracy becomes a certainty, while authoritarian regimes that assume power in relatively rich countries are likely to experience higher frequency of death. What matters to him are, of course, visits to the past visits to democracy. The more the visits to the past visits to democracy, the greater is the propensity, the greater is the probability that these countries will experience some kind of a democratic transformation. Asimoglu, Robinson, Robinson here at Harvard, spoke about this path-breaking work on this thing, on income and democracy, as being positively correlated over long periods of time, but there is no evidence of causality between income and democracy. Probably, according to them, that the omitted variable, an omitted variable, most probably historical factors, appear to have shaped the divergent political and economic development paths of various societies, leading to the so-called positive association between democracy and economic performance. Both democracy and development are a result of a third set of factors, historical or otherwise. Cheney, very this article by Cheney at Harvard, also takes a historical view, and he says that the reason democratic deficit legacy is attributable to weak civil societies where political power is concentrated today in the hands of military and religious leaders that work to perpetuate the status quo. This is the thesis of his paper. And finally, a paper by Kourou, I'm not sure it was 2011 or 212, who focuses on the influence of the Ronquier frontier state as a region-wide phenomenon, not as a state-bound phenomenon, 
that is a region-wide phenomenon which helps explain the persistence of authoritarianism in Muslim majority countries both in the MENA as well as in Central Asia. In contrast with the other democratic experience of Muslim majority countries in other regions of the world where democracy has taken place. So it is really this Rontier effect taken as a regional phenomenon that explains why is it in, in the Arab countries, in Muslim majority Arab countries as well as neighboring countries in Central Asia, they did not experience the kind of democratic transformation that was experienced in Muslim majority countries in other regions of the world. And I don't have time here, of course, to go into a details of comparative analysis of all these theses uh, and explanations, be they causal or be they non-causal, which are largely based, of course, on cross-country work, on models. But I would like to offer a few observations about this particular issue based on work I have done with my friend Brahim al-Badawi, which focuses basically on the post-independence period of the Arab region and poses the question, which is contrary to the modernization theorem, that despite notable socio-economic development in the, in the post-Second World War, the Arab region failed to democratize, at least significantly and on average, at least until the beginning of the current uprisings in Tunisia and Egypt, in contrast with what happened in other regions of the world, and this was shown with, by the first graph. Uh, I would like to pose some three or four observations concerning this explanation as to why this has been the case. Not taking the post-World War period and not taking the historical view going back three, four, or a thousand years back to the Islamic conquests. My first comment is that, of course, much of what has been said about an explanation for democracy deficits in the Arab world, in the Arab region, it rests on, on cross-country work, on models, regression models. And I want to caution that useful as these things are, important as they are, uh, elaborating a framework within which we can work, and this is very, very significant, they should be supplemented by individual case studies to bring out country-specific explanations as to why a certain country has lacked in terms of its political development, to understand, in fact, the, 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 to understand the socio-political, historical reasons that might help shed light on why is it that democracy in Egypt or, or, or democracy in, in Jordan was lacking. The reasons may not be the same, though the cross-country work may give you sort of over an overall view. So what may, what may apply regionally does not necessarily apply at least in equal measure to individual countries. We have two case studies will permit us, will shed light on the political economic dynamics of these countries in a historical context. My second observation is that, okay, let's take the region as a whole as a first approximation. And what do we find? We find that there are two defining elements of the contemporary Arab world that are interlocking elements that, in fact, differentiate it, I submit, differentiate it from the rest of the other, other regions of the world. The one is the huge, immense, huge or immense oil resources, the famous Tronti effect in the literature, this trade-off between <coughs> economic well-being and political participation or political rights, and the comparatively high level of conflicts including international interventions, civil wars, and also the, the unresolved Arab-Israeli conflict or the Palestinian question. These two factors, this, the, this, this interaction between huge oil resources and conflicts in the region have worked to constrain the region's democratization process, or so we submit. Secondly, now, secondly, within this, this, within this uh, uh, observation, the Rontier effect is a, is a well-known effect. But it doesn't only apply to its direct effects in the countries themselves, in the oil countries, where there is trade-off between economic welfare and political participation. 
but in fact there is a non, non there are non indirect effects that affect other countries of the, in, the, uh, in the region where the oil wealth spending has in fact helped constrain the process of uh, democracy and I think this is what uh, Kuru that I referred to earlier meant when he said that this pr proximity of the Central Asian countries to the Middle East because of this called international because of the Ranke effect help perpetuate autocracy there more so than other Muslim majority countries so this whether we accept it or not the Ranke effect is well known in, in the literature and in fact it has had a very uh, negative effect on the uh, democratic development of the region conflicts uh, they have historically after the second world war provided all sorts of pretexts for the ruling parties families to justify their automatic grip on power I mean they used to say there were you know, fears of fundamental uh, fundamentalist movements Islamic movements there are external threats that we have to face we have now no uh, time to live up to democratic traditions both oil and of course have invited foreign interventions for both reasons, oil interests and the, 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 their, their interest in the ongoing conflicts and this in itself, and I think this has not been a well researched subject, I think that the role of foreign intervention in perpetuating autocracies in the Arab region ought to be uh, uh, much more research than that's been so far. Now, over time, over time, the pretexts of the autocracies autocr holding on to power, I think probably whatever they are, oil, or interests, uh, uh, conflicts, or whatnot, have been weakened, as demonstrated by the recent uprisings. But they are still there. So, Let's go from this cross-country work, regional work, these defining elements, and go beyond into, if we were to take case studies into account, what do we find? The first thing we find is that what applies regionally may not necessarily apply at least in equal measure to individual countries. Hence, the impact of oil and conflict is not necessarily the same. It does vary from one country to another. In some countries, these are very these effects are very strong in other countries in fact they are not that strong in fact, they may not even exist so therefore in understanding the dynamics the political dynamics of any single country we have to dig deep into the socio-economic history of that, of that country concerned uh, that will help shed light on the persistence of the democracy deficit in each of these countries Egypt for example it is said Researchers say that what has helped perpetuate the democratic deficit in Egypt is deindustrialization, with a declining share of industry in the growth, or in the growth and the rise of services as a component of development. In Lebanon, in Lebanon, which is classified with a political score of seven, I think is wrong on the political score, as a very advanced democracy, is a plus seven. Sectarianism has played its role in preventing Lebanon from going from a so-called our sectarian democracy into a more mature type of democracy. In Jordan, I'm just giving examples, the, the Jordanian-Palestinian divide has played a role in retarding the democratic process. In Algeria, the triangular alliance of the ruling party, the army, and the bureaucracy have all has also played a role in trying to hold the democratic process. Uh, they may not have succeeded totally, but certainly they have had their effect in hindering the democratic process in that country. What they did, what this alliance did, in fact, that when during times of economic hardships, they tended to let go, to let to liberalize, and when with the, when the oil resources, when things did improve, they went back and tightened the grip on, on political participation. Well, let me take this business of the oil and the conflicts. What the case studies show is that the effect, the impact of oil cannot be considered in isolation of the specific socio-political history of the country concerned. How? Iraq. The effect of oil wealth was tempered 
by the ability of the cross-ethnic nationalist movement to undermine the legitimacy of the monarchy. The monarchy was overthrown in 1958, right? 1958. Despite our resources. In Algeria, the influence of oil wealth should be considered in the context of the particular alliance of the party that took over after independence. Along with the military and the bureaucracy. This was the alliance, the triangular, triangular alliance that perpetuated non-democratic practices. Kuwait. We cannot neglect the role of the merchant class, historic role of the merchant class, that was able to extract political rights before the oil era, and of course maintained it after the oil era. That's why we have an, an elected assembly in Kuwait since a long time. Saudi Arabia, the Wahhabi influence, fundamentalism, fundamentalist religious groups have throughout exercised great influence over the nature of the state, before oil and after oil. So indeed, we have to have, we have to account when we are talking about the oil impact, we cannot consider it in isolation of the socio-political history of the country concerned, irrespective of what the cross-country work shows. Conflicts, and in particular the negative impact of the Arab-Israeli conflict, seems to vary with distance from the center of the conflict, Palestine. G with a greater impact on the neighboring countries, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Egypt, than more distant countries, the Gulf or North Africa. Civil war effects in Sudan and in Lebanon. In Sudan, civil wars, conflict. They contributed to a deepening of sectarian divisions and encouraged military coups. In Lebanon, after, especially after the civil war, the effects was to deepen sectarian feelings and sectarian allegiances in Lebanon and hinder, therefore hindering a, a potential move to a more mature democratic regime in the country. I would like to add another factor that had helped hinder the process of democratization. And this is the success of many of the Arab regimes in co-opting various classes of intellectuals, businesses, and civil, civil societies. There was a co-option of these groups. Of course, this was not inclusive, and it, it did vary from place to place. But they were able to co-opt, intellect, especially intellectuals, by giving them privileges, positions, and so on and so forth. And this, apparently, in many of the case studies, came out as one of the factors that have hindered the democratization process. Well, okay, this is the background that we're talking about. What about the breakthroughs that have taken place? We are talking, obviously, about Tunisia and Egypt. And we are hoping that they have opened the, way, opened the door, at least partially, to a potential democratic transformation of the Arab region as a whole. Have they? Let's see. There are two models of what happened since Tunisia and Egypt. The first one is the relatively peaceful, not totally peaceful, uprising that took place in Tunisia and Egypt, and, 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 and Egypt with popular uprisings that ultimately led to the overthrow of the regime with the army taking sort of a neutral stand. And you have the other model where there has been quite bloody, uh, bloody uprisings, revolts, as has taken place in Yemen, Syria currently, Libya, and Bahrain. Uh, there have been stirrings in other Arab countries, but they have been very limited. In Jordan, in Algeria, in uh, Morocco, and even in Saudi Arabia. But these have not taken on you know, the magnitude of, of aiming out, enabling a change in, the, in these countries. Nonetheless, while most of the Arab countries still remain under autocratic grip, the foundations 
of this grip are expected to weaken in the future. Probably more so in the non-oil countries than in the oil countries. And here I would like to just uh, pose a few overall factors that are pushing in this direction. Again, I'd like to warn that we're talking about overall factors, but that we should not neglect the fact that in each country there are country-specific factors that will act to determine the outcome uh, or not. So uh, this business of differentiating between cross-country work and case study work is extremely important. But let me talk a little bit about the overall factors. I submit that the first factor that has weakened and will continue to weaken authoritarian rule in the region is a declining economic role of the state. The sharp rise and the consequent sharp rise in unemployment, especially of youth unemployment in the region. The shift, the gradual shift to market institutions meant that those states that were employed, everybody, okay, albeit inefficiently, but nonetheless they were employed and they were paid, led to a growth of unemployment. In turn, the, the figures that we have from the ILO says that in the Arab region, youth unemployment is about 25% of the total employable youth, which is the highest this is for the period 2, 5 to 10, the average, which is highest, the highest uh, percentage in, in, in all, among all regions. In turn, this decline in the, in the economic growth has tended to weaken the regime's authoritarian bargain. The ability of the governing classes to trade off economic welfare and privileges for political rights and participation. It also has promoted or permitted the promotion and growth of independent civil society organizations that traditionally press for independent, independent civil society organizations that traditionally press for democratic transformation and freedom because many of the civil societies under the autocratic rules were co-opted by the state. And the civil society were speaking, were preaching the message of the, of the, of, of the government. The Arab, as I said before, the Arab regimes tried to counter this trend by co-opting civil society and by co-opting intellectuals. But this, with the declining, with the declining economic role of the, uh, of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the state, this possibility of co-option uh, has declined along with it. The second factor that has sort of helped promote the breakthroughs is the impact of openness, greater openness within and with the outside. This has tended to weaken the ability of the government to divide the position and help promote independent civil society organizations, including those run by students and social groups, to press for political change. This openness that has take, been taking place within and with the outside has also acted like a, at least a catalyst in this direction. The third factor that has also pushed in this direction and demonstrated by what happened in Tunisia and Egypt and that I think has been neglected by writers on the region is the deep-seated ambition not only for socio-economic advancement but also the thirst for greater freedom and political participation. There is a thirst on the part of large segments of the populace that had felt that they were marginalized, they had no political rights, and they were not benefiting from the fruits of whatever economic development was taking place. Uh, Egypt and Tunisia, I think the, the, youth, the youth revolt very much reflects this thirst for greater participation that we have been marginalized and that we really want to have more of a say in the destiny of our countries. Now, these uprisings of the, of the youth I should really add, was influenced by two underlying factors. Primarily, they lost faith in the role of traditionalist, reformist, 
political parties which proved incapable, for whatever reason, to act as agents of political change and therefore had to be left behind. Secondarily, the ripple effects of the important democratic changes that have been taking place in other regions of the of the of the of the of the of the, of the, of the developing world. So you can you know with the internet you can no longer hide things. Finally, the fourth factor affecting the transition process relates to the potential impact of settling justly regional conflicts. In particular, in my book, the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, in, in, in the past, the pretext of the fact that our conflicts were very, very important. Now, these may have waned. The influence of regional conflicts in retarding the democracy process may have waned. But I submit that it will take a just resolution, that a just resolution is necessary, is no doubt necessary if we are to create a regional environment that's much more amenable to the cause of democracy. As long as regional conflicts and the Arab Saudi conflict has not been resolved, I submit that the democracy in the Arab world will not necessarily stop, but it certainly will be a negative element in that process. Well, the road ahead, the road ahead, of course, the question that we have posed at the beginning, will these uprisings lead to substantive democracy in the region? Or indeed, in the countries which have witnessed these uprisings, or should we at best expect partial democracies, quasi-democracies, whatever you want to call it? Especially when account is taken of the rising influence of fundamental groups. It's an easy question that I will leave for Rami. Thank you.